is a link to the to the slide deck, to the code, and then the data we'll be using today. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. So my plan for today is we're going to go ahead and start with kind of a, an explanation of what is bias and equity in measurement models and how we'd go about and what that kind of what that looks like and so different ways we can test that statistically. And then we're going to go ahead and open up R and I'm going to run through kind of examples of how to run three primary different detection methods for this. I do want to mention that this is purely a quantitative focus on how to assess for bias and equity from a testing perspective. So that being said, because it is from a testing perspective, this is a, a large data set type analysis. So we're talking a couple of hundred responses. So the techniques I want to mention, they're not really well suited for like less than 100, just because you're not going to have enough statistical power to adequately test these. Um, so this is really kind of large scale assessment type territory, but it's we're going to talk through kind of the different options that are available and kind of depending on what you're doing and your sample size there's some different options that you can do and some fun stuff with it. So um, my name is Eric. I'm the Senior Quantitative and Computational Research Methodologist in CTRL. I'm in the R of CTRL. And again, happy. I love psychometrics. It's my specialty, so I, I love talking about it. Uh, and I'm my personal research actually falls within differential item function measurement and variance. So actually detecting potential bias. I work a lot with the methodologies of this. So that's my personal research area too. So I'm happy to be able to, to kind of really talk about it today. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the learning outcomes. So we're going to talk broadly what measurement models are. We're going to talk about why we should really care about bias and equity when we're doing measurement in any sort of setting. We'll talk about different methodologies that we have available, like mimic models or multiple indicator, multiple causes, uh, measurement and variance models, differential item functioning from an item response theory perspective. And we're going to then apply these into an to actually run these and see, like, okay, what, what does that process actually look like to run this? It's not going to be a very in-depth in terms of the analysis. There's a lot, we're not going to clean the data. We're not going to go into all possible different variations of it. It's mostly provided as an overview. However, if you're interested in learning more, please send me an email, let me know. Happy to chat more and we can go from there. Um, so learning outcomes, at the end of this, won't you be able to describe what bias and equity look like from a measurement perspective, to be able to identify different types of measurement bias, and then be able to recognize some of the different options, the different tools for our tool buds that we have to be able to detect measurement bias, and then how to interpret the results from that. Uh, so if you have questions during this, I'm gonna try to have my eyes on the chat as well. Let me go ahead and make sure I post in the link one more time to the slides and everything in there. Uh, so th some of the assumptions that this workshop is gonna make is that you're familiar with some latent variable modeling like confirmatory factor analysis, or that you've done a little bit of item response theory. You don't need to have expertise in that, that's perfectly okay. And if you haven't, if you're not familiar with those, that's okay too. Uh, because I'm also happy to share, uh, we have different workshops and recorded ones that like item response theory or latent variable modeling. I'm happy to share any and all resources in the videos for that as well, if you wanted to kind of watch those at a later time too. Uh, again, just let me know, I'm always happy to do that. I'm a big proponent of open data, open coding and open resources because that's, that's how things should be. So when we're talking about measurement models, what we're saying is that we have this underlying construct that we're really interested in. It could be SPSS anxiety, like within this visual, or it could be happiness. Now, we can't just take like a an instrument like a sonic screwdriver and point it at someone and like, oh yeah, that's their happiness, or oh, that's their SPSS anxiety. We, we can't do that. So instead, we have different, we use different collections of items. Uh, so this could be like um, reflective items, like I get nervous when I open up SPSS or SPSS terrifies me, just the thought of having to run stuff in the analyses. And so each of these is kind of getting at this idea of SPSS anxiety. So even though we're focusing on something that we can't directly measure, we're using different items to be able to get a sense of someone's anxiety. Now we can also take this from a testing perspective. Like if we take it like a math test or the GREs, we have under individuals underlying abilities on math achievement or on verbal or on different aspects. Maybe it's like a, a geometry test. Well, we can probably get an idea of someone's aptitude towards geometry 
with a series of questions. So it's the same idea. So it doesn't have to be testing. It doesn't have to be personality factors or these different psychological factors. It could be a mixture of the two. So really, it's, it's a really broad way of kind of looking at how we try to measure a construct. So measurement models, they're really the foundational part when you do structural equation modeling. So whenever we're talking about constructs being related to another construct, I'm a big fan of keeping it at the construct level, not like this mean score, because that's not exactly the same thing as a construct score. So think of it as like a, as a building a house. You need to have a strong foundation before you start building a second floor or a first floor off that, the concrete foundation. So the measurement model is really that foundation piece. So we start typically with what's called a confirmatory factor analysis, or you can also do it from a, an item response theory model. And so what we do is we try to figure out how well these items fit the data in measuring this construct. So for our example here, let me go ahead and get the little laser pointer here. We have SPSS anxiety. It's because of someone's anxiety that they're responding to these items in a certain way. So if they have really high anxiety, they might say, say like strongly agree to like SBSS terrifies me in my waking hours or something like that. So it's because of someone's underlying construct. That's why they're responding to these items in a certain way. So we're, we usually observe scores like a test score or a response to a scale item to better understand capture someone's construct. So again, we're interested in the latents. We can't measure that directly. So we use items to then be able to get a better sense of someone's score within this. Now, from a measurement perspective, uh, what we're trying to do is what's called measurement equivalence. So that means that different groupings or different subsets within a population are gonna be using the test and responding it in the same way. So persons with the same score of someone's under, or this underlying construct, say um, SPS anxiety, because we have that from the first slide, or from the earlier slide. Well, individuals who have that same identical score on that underlying construct, you're expected to have be responding the same way to the items. Well, if you don't have measurement invariant, so if measures are what's called measurement non-invariant, so different subgroups are answering or responding to these items differently, even though they have the same level of that construct, that means there's an issue with the measure. So that means that when we try to get those mean scores to get differences, that's really the true mean difference between it plus some difference on that latent variable on the observed score that's not identical across groups. So we have error, we have bias within this. From a testing perspective, think of it as we have the standardized test and if different subpopulations within the population are responding to it differently, then we have a biased item where one group is underperforming or that, that test is, is um, individuals from a certain population might be doing better on that test because it's biased for them. So we wanna make sure we have equity in measurement. Uh, so this is used a lot within different educational testing. Some of the major companies like ETS, Kaplan, they have whole teams that just look at bias and equity within measures. Because if, if it's just capitalizing on error, or this bias, that's a problem. That's a huge, huge issue. And that calls into question how we can use those scores on things. So a big picture, we're gonna talk about bias and equity. Why is this important? Well, I, I wanna really kind of point out the issue in the room, so to speak. Statistics and psychometrics, specifically psychometrics, has a deeply troubling and problematic history. Um, Francis Galton, one of the key figures in modern statistics, he was trying to use statistical analyses to make general statements about the superiority of different classes within England and European origin race that were really fitting his eugenic agenda. Not a good human being. I also wanna to mention too, that it's built off of this in not just Galton, but many other statisticians, uh, Pearson is a good example too. We're trying to use this for eugenic agendas and so forth. So I really like this quote that, um, is a, it is true that the positivistic statistical analysis have been central to the oppression of minoritized communities historically. What we, what we reject, however, is the idea that analytical procedures can be simply reduced to the master's tools. Instead, we can use these tools for critical and progressive social purposes. 
And this is from early works within quantitative critical or cri critical race theory from a quantitative perspective. How can we use modern statistical analyses to really push forward progressive social purposes and for social justice? So quant crit, happy to share any resources about it. It's fantastic. It's much needed, but there's a lot of work that needs to get done. There's so much work that needs to get done within this. So it's really important within this, like psychometric methods for measurement detection and bias, this is gonna be a really important tool to ensure that we have scales and measures and tests that are not biased and that are equitable. If we don't have that, then it's, a, it's really problematic. So when we're talking about modern or psychometric techniques to really identify biases, there's three main ones. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are the three primary ones we're gonna be talking about today. The first one is what's called a mimic model or multiple indicator, multiple causes. This is from a classical test theory perspective. So we have true score plus error, and that's gonna be getting our, our observed score. That's a classical test theory. We also have measurement and variance model. That's more from a structural equationing model perspective, still classical test theory, but it's gonna be a little bit stronger than mimic. It, it's a little bit more precise. So think of it as mimic models are kind of the, the chainsaw me, or measurement and variance is gonna be the, the pairing knife, differential item function from modern, from modern test theory or item response theory, that's your scalpel. So it really kind of depends on about the precision. So when it, what we're gonna do next in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna talk about each of these three methods, what they are, how they relate to equity and bias detection. And then we're gonna talk about what are the steps within that. And then we're actually gonna go ahead and apply it. Um, before we go delve into the specific instances of the models, I just wanna do a quick check-in, see if there's any questions. Uh, so if you have any questions so far, feel free to unmute yourself or if you wanna put it in the chat or if um, all good so far, just uh, give me the kind of a thumbs up and then I'll also kind of, that'll also be helpful too. So just let me know. Okay, so I see a couple of thumbs up. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, um, so I'm gonna do another check before we, so after we talk about the different methods and then, so how do we do with that? But before we open up the data and the R code, I'm gonna do another kind of check just to make sure, see if there's any questions and go from there too. So what we're gonna first talk about is the mimic model. So this is a really, really good approach. It's, it's not gonna be as strong as a standard measurement and variance technique, but it does allow you to kind of look at some potential relationships of potential bias within group memberships. Now, something I do wanna mention though. So when we're looking, when we're talking about uh, bias, when we're talking about equity within this, there are gonna be some issues within how we're conceptualizing the potential groupings within this. And this is because the quantitative methods currently, they're not in well developed enough to really look at intersectionality or look at identity as across a continuum. Instead, it's categorized instead. So that's a major, major limitation. And there's work being done trying to look at intersectionality, to look at rather than categorization, I should look at it as that continuum, which is more appropriate. Um, but it's, again, it's just in the emphasis right now of looking at it in terms of an equity type of mindset. So within multiple indicators, multiple causes or mimic models, what we start first start with is we have our measurement model or confirmatory factor analysis. So we wanna have good model fit. Um, so this is actually really good for smaller sample sizes. So if you have like, um, 100, 75 to 100 per group that you're comparing, then this is a good option. It's used to detect latent mean differences. So that's looking at the construct differences between a group. So a zero, one dummy coded group. Uh, for here, we have an example where um, we dummy coded exogenous covariate, a fancy term for just a group membership variable, where zero is white, one is black. It's our dummy coded variable. And we start with our measurement models. We have our construct and each of these items are measuring our construct. So before we add that grouping membership variable, we will first make sure across the whole sample, do we have good model fit? From there, once we have good model fit, we're essentially, we're partialing out the error based on group memberships. So we're looking at 
a differential item function or diff. So what we can do is we can look at race, ethnicity group membership or other type of memberships as a rough proxy. So this is again, it's a rough, rough proxy. But we can see, okay, are there differences? If we have a line between race to our latent mean, that's our construct score. We think, okay, are there latent differences within this based on group membership? And we can also then start looking at detecting fairness in the testing by saying, okay, are these items, is there a bias? Is one group compared to another group being unfair or looking at this differently, or interpreting this differently, or have bias against a group? So this allows us to look at where the items are potentially causing issues of bias. Now, when I'm talking about biased items, it could be the wording, it could be the content, it could be the framing of the question, it could, hopefully this isn't happening, but it could be the language or the specific, um, if there's specific examples within this that really they're not appropriate, that's a big issue that should not be in the measure to begin with. But if something within the item is causing an unfair advantage or disadvantage to a group. So what we can do whenever we're looking at this for flagging an item that's biased, we, we can't say that the item is biased necessarily. So we can say we could be flag it. We say this is a potential biased item because this is just a statistical way of assessing it. What we really need then is take it that next step and say, okay, we need to have essentially a committee where you have experts who know the population that we're looking at, who know the constructs we're looking at and can look at the test, like looking at the items, looking at the wording. Yeah, this, is a, this isn't worded well, or this is a problem one. This is causing individuals to think of X, Y, Z, or this is an unfair question because of this. And then we can try to either revise the question or the statement or drop it, but it's, it really needs to be a, a committee that makes those decisions, especially individuals from that population or that subpopulation. We need to have the opinions and their thoughts on this because that's going to help us decide, is this an item that's a problem or is this a biased item? And then we try to do what's called uh, in differential item function, it's called item purification. So you remove that item, that's a problem. And hopefully trying to make a better equitable measure. So the idea too within this is let's say that we do, we flag an item that's a potentially biased. But the committee they look at, and we're not able to really determine, like, okay, it doesn't, we're not seeing any potential bias. We might want to retain it, but maybe revise it or kind of think through, well, why is it biased? Because that's an important thing for that justification, too. I do want to say within major testing companies, they, they have full panels and full divisions that just this is all they do all day is just look for potential items, look for trying to really make sure it's an equitable measure or an equitable test. The, um, so this is a really, it's a rough way to test for, for potential bias with an item, but it's really good for small sample sizes again. It's not gonna be as strong as measurement and variance which we'll talk about next, but you can actually start looking at interactions. So if we had looking at different races, right now we have, uh, this would be our African-American or black dummy coded variable. We can actually include other covariates or other categories in here too, but we just test them one at a time. You can also then create an interaction term. It's, it's gonna be a really rough approximation of intersectionality. It's, it's not great. But because you might run into small sample sizes and has also other issues, but is a potential way to get an initial checks within this. This is based off Helm's individual differences model. There's a fantastic citation uh, towards the end if you're interested in learning more about this. Um, this is really Helm's work really was at the forefront of equity measurement. So this is pulling a lot from this ideas in this literature. Uh, again, a big issue, though, is that it reifies this racial and ethnic categorization, which is problematic in and of itself. So it's not on a continuum, it is just a binary categorization, which again, that's a problem. So the steps within this, what we wanna do is we wanna have a good fitting, kind of a good fitting measurement model first, then we add in our grouping variable, our membership variable, and it could be multiple membership variables, we just have to test it one at a time. We look first for any significant latent mean differences. Are the differences on the latent scores within this? And then what we do is we say, okay, 
once we look at that, we look at any of the items that we need to have a relationship between our grouping member and these reflective variables, so that construct or the scale items or the test items. If, the, if we need to have a line drawn between those, so if we drew a line between like this negative 0.45, that's telling me that's a biased item, that's a problem. So if we see that, and we say, oh, if we need add this relationship, it's going to improve model fit, then that's an indicator right then that it's a potentially biased item. So we look for those, and then we add those paths to see if that's that bias or that diff. Really, really, again, I want to strongly, strongly caution uh, with this. I'm going to read the quote because I think it's so important to get there, to get in the specific wording. The multifaceted nature of race and ethnicity suggests that when we should operationalize as a stable homogeneous entity or simply as a dummy coded or categorical variable like one white zero being non-white any statistical association will typically offer little to no insight to which the the key elements of any mechanisms of action be it fear of outgroup neighborhood effects or other factors that's a problem again this is going to helpfully we help we're trying to use this technique to determine potential equity within the measure by having no biased items in there, but the method itself, it's not perfect. So just wanted to mention that. And the same thing is gonna go for the other methodologies. Again, because we're using, we're having to use a grouping variable that's simply categorization and that's not really a good, it's not a true proxy to real world. The other options, what we have is called measurement invariance. Um, this is where I really spend a lot of my time in personally. So it's a much stronger method. It requires a larger sample size and it's, there's more steps to it. But let's say, for example, I'm looking at um, the pictures of the dogs or cats. Let's say I have a dog and a cat and I wanna see how much their energy levels and how much, so try to figure out their energy and I use how much they play with their toys as a, essentially our measured variables to get an idea of how much energetic they are. Well, let's say my cat was, was trying to play with the ball, but it got scared by the ball and now she doesn't play with it. Well, that's telling me that the differences I see within this for energy is because of that potential bias so that issue with the ball, not necessarily true differences in energy or how energetic they are. So, that's kind of a rough idea of what measurement invariance is. So we're looking at, well, where the differences are that might be leading to individuals answering in different ways. So we start with a, a, really strong, a really weak form of invariance and we try to figure out and kind of add additional stricter invariance. So when we talk about uh, constraining groups, we're essentially saying the parameters, whether it's the factor loading, so that line between the construct and the observed variable, we're setting those across equal to be across groups, then the intercepts, and then the variances to go from there. So first we start like do the same to the groups that we have. Is it the same number of factors? And the factors to items, are they the same across groups? Does it have the same the same configuration? From there, we set the path coefficients for constraining that across groups. And then the intercepts, and then the air variances and covariance across groups. So we're going from least restrictive to most restrictive. Honestly, once we get to metric, so once we get those path coefficients constrained, then we can start comparing differences across groups. I like, I'm of the mindset that you test all levels because you really want to make sure you have a, a measure that's equal across groups, that it's the differences you might see is might be from differences of abilities on a test rather than group differences within this. So another way to kind of think about this is, is the structure, so the number of factors and items across groups, that's the configurable. This is answering the question, are the factors being manifested in the same way across groups? Is one group looking at this and it's uh, just a single dimension of SPSS anxiety, while another group, it's actually multifaceted. This other, com it's more complex. So the first one is, is the structure the same? The next part is factorial and metric invariances. Are the factor coefficients the same? This is answering the questions, do these items or these questions, do they have different meanings across the groups? Are different groups interpreting them differently? If so, that's an issue. If 
if we find support for that they're meaning the same ways, then we go to the next level, which is scalar invariance. That's intercepts are the same. This is answering the question, are the factors, oops, I, so this is, do they have the same response sets, like strongly agree, strongly disagree? Are, they, are individuals from different groups answering them in the same way if they have the same underlying construct score? And then finally, scalar, are the factors being measured the same way across groups? So there's four different levels within this. And that's kind of the structure we test from the least restrictive to the most restrictive. Um, it mentions here about frequentist measurement and variance techniques. I do uh, frequentist and Bayesian. We're gonna talk about uh, just frequentist for now. Bayesian's a whole another animal. But I wanna mention some of the, the main things of how we determine measurement and variance or the, the measure itself that it's being responded to and means the same thing across different groups. So we have a couple of options within this. We have the likelihood ratio test. It's a, a chi-square test that you compare the baseline model to a more constrained model. So the idea is if you have no significant difference between the, the least constrained to the more constrained, then there's no differences within it. That's good, you want non-significance. If there's statistical significance, that means that one model is statistically better than another and there's that difference. So it's actually a, almost like a misfit. Now I wanna mention though, this chi-squared test, chi-squared is problematic with really large sample sizes. So you're gonna to tend to reject the null. So you tend to have, have statistical significance just because you have so many people, you'll detect the smallest deviations. The downside is structural equation modeling, CFAs, this type of analysis, it needs, roughly over 200, between 150 to 200, maybe more per group to be able to adequately assess uh, potential biased items. So it's a large sample type analysis. So that's gonna be a potential issue. Some other options is when we look at the model, how well the model fits the data, we have things called model fit. So we, we want high model fit and high, or and we want low misfit. So if we start comparing models as we add more constraints to and constrain different parameters, if we start seeing drastic reductions in model good model fit and increases in bad model fit, then we know there's an issue. So these are some different ways, so some different thresholds that are recommended within this. Um, so I do want to mention that kind of the steps you run a multi-group CFA. So it's a multiple group confirmatory factor analysis. And at each step, you're constraining or you're setting the parameters of interest at each step to be equal across the groups. Uh, typically, this is two groups. So I've seen it done within like 15 groups. It gets a little tricky, um, but it's, it's doable. So you're comparing and setting this across equal and seeing, okay, where are the misfits? So if you have a significant likelihood ratio test or large reductions in model of fit, we have non-invariance. That means that our measures functioning differently across the groups. If we have a non-significant likelihood ratio test or small reductions in model fit, then that level of invariance is supported. And that means that the scale is performing equally across groups. We want equal, you know, equality across groups within this. Um, again, issues within this, we have a nominal grouping variable, categorical grouping variable. That's not gonna be true if we think about how these variables are actually in real life, how they function. Uh, CFA is a good to start with. If you have a poor CFA to start with, then again, it's a house of cards, it's a problem. And you need large sample sizes. Um, I do wanna mention if you're gonna be using measurement and variance, this is a comparison of those four different approaches I'd mentioned on a previous slide. This is actually a statistical simulation I ran a couple months back. And we can kind of see the degree of the non-invariance in the parameter. This was just within that path coefficient. This is metric invariance. It's one of the earlier ones that you really need large sample sizes and a large degree of differences in the groups to really be able to detect this. And we can see that some of these options underperform compared to the others. So I recommend the likelihood ratio test in the mead option. However, if you get to a really large sample size, then that likelihood ratio test, that's gonna be a problem then too, because it's detecting, it potentially detecting things that it shouldn't. 
Uh, so finally, the third option that we're going to talk about is what's called differential item functioning. And that's a really broad term. It's, it's related to measurement invariance and bias detection in mimic models, but it's from an item response theory perspective. So what this means is it's the probability of getting an item right given the person's ability and membership of the group. And we want that probably of getting uh, an item right given the person's ability. We want that to be equivalent. If there's differences, if the individuals in both groups, if they have the same underlying ability, what we call theta, but there's differences based on group membership, then we have differential item functioning. The item is potentially biased towards one group or another. Now, within an item response theory, what we do is we compare the probabilities in the different figures. So, in this lower left hand corner, this is what's called a uniform diff, a uniform differential item functioning. So one group has higher scores compared to the other group. We can see that the slopes are the same, but it's just shifted in proficiency. Even though they have the same underlying ability, the test or the scale is biased towards one group compared to another. And that's what we're trying to avoid. This is actually, a, this is a single item because at item responsibility, it's at the item level. What we can also have is what's called a non-uniform diff. So this actually means it doesn't favor the same group across all abilities. So we start seeing different slopes. And depending on what your group you're in and your ability, it's gonna have maybe more advantageous or disadvantageous depending on those combinations here. So what we're looking for is we want roughly parallel those parallel slopes and lines and be at the same location. That's what we're hoping for for um, item non in, or item invariance. If we get non invariance, then we get like that shifting of the location as well as the differences in slopes. So when to use, so when we do measurement equivalence in IRT, before we talk about when to use these things, you, you're comparing item parameters across different populations. There's different procedures within this. There's the, the Lord's chi-square test, Raju's area measure. This is like a load ratio test. There's also another procedure. We're gonna talk through a couple of my favorites, which is a logistic regression type methodology, uh, which is, it allows you to assess both uniform and non-uniform differential item functioning. Some of these options only assess one or the other. So that's a potential limitation. So it depend, So sometimes you have to use multiple assessments just to be able to detect, is there a bias within the items for one group versus another group? When we're doing this, it's multiple steps. So first thing we need to do is we need to assess the assumption of unidimensionality. Uh, item response theory, it's, that's one of the requirements of it. Um, unless you're doing multiple uh, multi-dimensional IRT, which is a whole other can of worms, which we're not gonna, we don't really have time to go into. Uh, but for ease, these should be kind of single constructs. We went on to appropriate, what's the appropriate IRT model? Is it a rash model? Where there's just different difficulty, or is there different difficulties? Is there a discrimination parameter of how will the items be able to determine low ability versus a higher ability? Then we select the diff test we want to run, then we flag the item for removal or revision by a committee. Um, I love IRT methods. The, there's some issues and considerations I want to mention, though, within this. It's you need really large sample sizes. We're talking over 500 sample sizes. Uh, this method works much better for dichotomous items, like correct, incorrect, or true, false. Um, and you really need to use specialized software like M plus, SAS, or R. Um, SPSS can't do it. So a lot of the um, things like JASP, Jamovi can't do it either. Excel, it's not going to happen. Uh, so you really need to use R or some other more specialized program, which also has, because it's specialized, they require a good amount of money. Um, M plus is a fantastic option or like wind steps or some other specialized IRT ones, but they're costly. Um, R is free. That's why we're going to be demoing it in R. So some differences though between classical testing and these IRT approaches. So the difference between the measurement invariance and the mimic and the IRT, mimic and measurement invariance, that's gonna be more of a linear relationship. That's classical test theory, whereas IRT is a non-linear relationship. IRT is better for dichotomous, or dichotomous items like yes, no, incorrect, correct. 
Whereas if you're using mimics or measurement invariants, you can use like Likert scalings uh, and it's better developed for CFAs. So it's kind of just some different things you need to kind of consider as you're doing this. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quickly show the different references and let me go ahead and before we do the demo, I'm gonna go ahead and put the link to the slides, the data and the code back in the chat. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is before I open up the application of R in our studio and show you the data set. I just wanna check in to see if there's any questions so far before we start trying some of the different models. Um, and if there's no questions, feel free to use like the thumbs up and that'll let me know, okay, okay um, we're good to go on to the next part. So I just wanted to check in with everyone. Okay, um, not seeing any questions. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start opening up some stuff and then we're gonna go through some different examples and I'm gonna walk you through all the steps of how to run these three different types of tests. So um, the first thing I wanna mention is this is, it's a synthesized version of my, I should just actually say a thesis data, not thesis dissertation. Um, it's similar measures to if I use my dissertation, but the thesis one was a little bit larger as sample size. Um, so I've reconfigured it, I've using a single measure within this and it's been synthesized. So it's actually not the true data. It's a simulation variant of the data. That way I'm able to share it. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and open up SPSS first, just so you can see what the data set looks like. Um, so you should now see, let me just kind of make sure I can see this. Um, do you all see a kind of an SPSS, almost like a, a spreadsheet with a bunch of data in it now? If so, just give me a thumbs up. Okay, good, I see a couple of thumbs up, great. Um, so this is a snapshot of my thesis data. This is about, I wanna say 882 cases. So it's, it's pretty substantial data set. I wanna make sure we had enough statistical power to be able to run some different tests. Um, so we have a participant ID, and then we actually have a Likert scaled measure here. So this is what's called the event centrality scale. Um, so I feel like it was another lifetime ago. I, I used to do trauma research for psychological trauma. I, I don't do that research anymore, uh, but I was kind of interested at the time using advanced statistical methods to better measure psychological traumas. So this was the idea that a, tr a potentially stressful life event or traumatic event, how much that gets internalized into the life story. Uh, so this is made up of items such as, this, is, this event has become a reference point to the way I understand myself and the world. I feel like this event has become a critical or essential part of my life story. This event permanently changed my life. This event was a turning point in my life. So it's how much this event has become central to the life story. Uh, so this is on a scale of one being strongly disagree up to uh, totally agree this data was collected over multiple years from 2011 to 2013. And the way we've asked demographics have shifted from that, but the rough, so kind of what we had here was um, for the race, uh, six different levels within this. And we also asked gender and we only had uh, two responses that were nominated. We had uh, several others in there, but it was only two that we received. Uh, and this was from a, a large uh, state school university in the Southwest of the United States. Um, so what I wanna do now is just to get an idea of what the data set looks like. I'm gonna go ahead and open up R now, and then we're gonna walk through the step-by-step -step within this and go through how we do the interpretations. So um, let me go ahead and switch this really quick. I like working in dark mode because it's much more easier on my eyes, but I feel like that might be not clear to read. So let me go ahead and just change this, or just invert it really quick, just to make sure it's a little bit, there we go. So hopefully that's easier to read. And let me go ahead and put this at a larger text size too. There we go. So hopefully that's a bit better. Um, so what I'm gonna do first is we're gonna walk through a mimic model first. We're gonna talk about measurement and variance and then differential item functioning. Uh, so for the first, we're gonna be using my thesis data. 
For the third, because my data is all Likert, iron response theory is better for dichotomous data. So actually when you're using a different data set for that, we'll talk about that in a little bit though. Uh, so first thing I'm gonna do is I've already downloaded my data set. I put it onto a folder on my desktop and I'm gonna be using um, Quattro documents. This is, it allows me to essentially have all these comments in it. And then the R code is all within a block. It's, it's easier to do kind of workshops with because you can comment a lot of stuff in it too. Uh, so first thing we wanna do is I'm gonna have the computers or have this, my code scan my computer and see are all these packages for our functions, are they already installed? And that's gonna go ahead and activate uh, some of the different things I'll need for this. So essentially just it's getting everything all set in R for me to start running stuff. Uh, some big ones we wanna use is Levon, that's for structural equationing modeling, along with some other SEM stuff. Rio is really good for importing data. And we'll be using the diff R package as well as Mert. Or if you, yeah, I think we'll be using Mert too, potentially. Um, let me check the code really quick. I'm trying to remember if I kept Mert. Um, oh, I just, yep, okay, cool. Just making sure. So we'll be using a couple of different packages to assess everything. So now that we have everything installed, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna set my working directory up. Now this path isn't gonna work for you because this is my personal computer. Or not personal, it's my work computer, but it's not gonna function for yours. So what I'm gonna do is, I like to go to session, set working directory, and then I'm gonna go ahead and point R to where the data set is stored. So I have this in a folder on my computer and I'm pointing to it. Now what I do is I'm gonna import the data set from SPSS directly into R, and then I'm just changing a gender to a factor and then race to a factor and just getting the counts, just making sure it's all in the order I need to run the analyses with. So looking at my breakdown of uh, my responses, there's about seven, a little less than 70% uh, women, about a little more than 30% men. Uh, so we have our race, went ahead and pulled that and coded that correctly within there. And now what I wanna do is I'm gonna go ahead and subset the data. So I'm gonna be looking at uh, Caucasian and comparing that with African-American and black. And I'm gonna go ahead and bind that. So I'm essentially subsetting my data based on self-identified race within the survey. And then I'm combining those two data sets. But I'm also creating a new variable called lowercase race in here, giving it a zero or one. And that's gonna be for the mimic model because you need to have that binary set up. So I'm going ahead and doing that because previously what I did was I created a factor, which is gonna be a different type of variable structure. So I just then take a quick peek at my data set, see, okay, does everything look pretty good? We have some missing data, that's okay. Um, but overall, it looks pretty good. And I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at the data set there. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and first do a mimic model. So first thing we, step we need to do within a mimic model is we need to run an overall confirmatory factor analysis. So I'm saying event centrality, CES, it's going to be, we're using our, these are all the reflective items that's gonna be essentially an indicator of our latent variable. Uh, so what I wanna do first is I'm gonna go ahead and essentially telling R what my model looks like for this. And now I start with saying, okay, I'm gonna run a confirmatory factor analysis because my data is Likert type. I'm just letting R know that it's an ordered response and I'm gonna get the fit instance or the fit information. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna see, okay, well, how well did the model fit the data? So I have a significant chi-square test, but again, I have over 800 responses. So I'm, I'm gonna be take that with a grain of salt. Now I'm gonna go ahead and see, okay, so this is, we want CFI and TLI to be close to one. That's really good, that's above 0.95. Um, our RMSCA is on the low side. We want that to be below 0.08. And our SRMR, we want that to be below 0.6. So that looks really good. When we look at our items, all our items are strong. So for each in, uh, unit increase in event centrality, there's a, a 1.04 increase in CES2 and so forth. So this all looks really good. And that's just our overall model fit.
Now, from there, what we do then is now we actually detect for potential bias using this mimic model. So what we do now is we're going to regress the latent event centrality scores, our latent construct scores that we have on our race variable that's been dummy coded. So we have Caucasian as zero, African-American or black as one, and we're adding another line to our model. We're regressing CES on race. So we're seeing are there latent differences, essentially like a latent t-test on that race variable, that dummy coded one. If we had multiple or categories we wanted to check for bias, we can include that in the model. We just have to do it one at a time. So now we have my model in there. I'm gonna go ahead and um, I've updated the models within there. I'm using my data set. And I'm gonna see, okay, within this, is there statistically significant differences in the latent means across that dummy coded variable? So first I take a look at my model fit. Really, this looks pretty good. I'm not seeing any big differences there. I'm really interested in this regression though. So we have this, um, this reduction here. So there's a difference, but it is not statistically significant. So if we had a p-value less than 0 0.050, that difference or the CS regressed on race would be statistically significant, indicating a mean difference or latent, a latent score difference between races. We're not seeing that. So now what we do is, okay, that's, that's good. So now the next step is gonna be, let's check for individual item biases, which is really where we're gonna be focusing our attention on. Are there items within this measure that are biased towards one group compared to another group? So what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and ask for modification indices. This is gonna let me know if I was to add a path between our race dummy coded and any of the items that would improve model fit. If we see any of that pop up, then I know we have a potential biased item. So I'm gonna go ahead and run that. And I'm looking for any, if I see race on either side of this with an item, then that's a, that's a flag for me saying, okay, that's gonna be an issue. That's a potentially biased item. Um, so looking at this, I am not seeing race popping up on any of these. So that's telling me that I'm not, there's no, ex, we don't have any items that would improve model fit. So we, we don't see a bias, potentially biased item here. If we did, what we would do is we would then add up that path between our dummy coded race variable and that item and see if it's still statistically significant. If so, then it's a potentially biased item and we would wanna go back to the committee and have that discussion and feel, okay, well, why is this biased and what can we do about it? Uh, so if we pretended, let's pretend that items two and three Let's pretend that there was that modification on improved model fit. I would add to the left-hand side of that equation items two and three, and I would run our mimic model. And then if that is also, I mean, looking at this, we still have good model fit, but we're gonna look over here at the different items regressed on race. If we saw statistical significance, then we're like, uh-oh, that's a problem. Now. I had picked out two items just randomly, but looking at this, I mean, this is not statistically significant, but if this was point, less than 0 0.050, then yeah, item two, because if that was, let's pretend that was, then that means that there's differences of how this item is being interpreted based on whether or not a one or zero for our race dummy coded. That's a potentially biased item, if this was significant. Um, again, kind of close, but... It, it technically isn't, uh, but that's how we go through that process of if to detect it. So that's a that's a mimic model. Mimic is a really really, it's it's a little bit rough because it doesn't give you a lot of the precision that you don't that you would get in measurement invariance or differential item functioning. But it's a really quick tool that you can use, and you can have multiple options within this, and it's it's a good option to use, honestly. If you have a larger data set, then these other two approaches will be better options. So what I want to do now is want to shift to a multi-group CFA for measurement invariance and then walk through each of those steps and how we would interpret, like kind of how we would test it and then interpretation, what we would do if we did have a biased item or how we would detect it. So the idea within this is that first, so we're going to do two different methods within this, actually three. Uh, the first method, you have much more control within it. The second and third option is a little bit more automated. I like 
the more controlled one because it really get, lets you know the data and you're able to take a closer look at stuff. So the first thing I do first is we need to assess for the configurable variance. That means the same factor structure across groups. We start before that with just an overall model using the entire data set. So we have our CES, this is all of our items are reflective of our construct event centrality. So we're gonna go ahead and run that model. So we have that loaded in there. Then I'm gonna go ahead and just run a basic CFA, just like we did with an amemic model. So it's that same initial step. And we take a quick inspection, look at the model fit. Is this good model fit? If not, then we, we can't even go that far. Uh, so then what we do is we test our configurable. So that's saying that the factor structure, the number of, of constructs, the items to, uh, to the different constructs, it's all the same. So what we do now is we take our same model, but now we have a grouping variable and we include race in there. So that's our dummy coded variable within it. And we're gonna use just items or the same items where we're saying that this is like or scaled. We say, okay, within this, do we have good model fit? Um, so looking at this, we're still seeing really good model fit. So I'm, I wouldn't be too, too worried within it. So it looks pretty good, but we also need to do a statistical test to compare the two. So within this, it actually gives you for group one, it gives you all the parameter estimates and what the model fit looks like. And then we also have our group two, our African and black sample, and we get a look at that, what those parameters look like. Now, these path coefficients, we're allowing them to vary because they're not constrained. We're not setting them to be equal yet. That's gonna be the next step. So we can also take a quick peek at the, the model fit information, now that looks great. The next step is where we have what's called weak invariance or metric. So now we set those factor loadings to be equal across groups. If they're not, if we find misfit or significant differences, then we can say that the constructs, they're manifesting differently for the different groups. So we really want them to be the same. So now what I want to do is we, the easiest way is we have this other option here where we're saying set the groups, the loadings to be equal across our rates groups. So we're saying that these will be interpreted the same way across the groups. And we're testing that. So we run it. We take a look at it and you can open up like kind of a spreadsheet and just record the different model fit indices. I'm gonna show you a trick so you don't have to do that, but you can. I like just out of practice, taking a quick look at the data, looking at the results and say, okay, is this good? We can see here as a P2, P3, P4, and that's for our group one. Like P2 is 1.013. If I scroll down to our group two, oops, went too far. It's the same P2, 1.013. It's because we set those parameters to be equal, those factor loadings. So now what we can do is we can go ahead and get them all fits in a compact way, but we can actually run what's called a likelihood ratio test. That's that chi-square test to determine, okay, are there significant differences amongst this? So actually here, within this, we actually have a significant difference. This is saying like, uh-oh, yeah, we had configurable, but there's significant differences in our metric. This means that the um, looking at the items, they have different meanings across our variables. So we actually don't have measurement and variance based on this. That's an issue. So we'd want to probably stop here. And then we do what's called a partial invariance and we can kind of see, okay, what items have that potential bias? What one's causing potential issues? And that's where we'd go from there. As practice, I'm gonna walk you through the next couple of steps. I'm gonna circle back to figure, okay, what item is the problem? So, or items, it could be multiple items, honestly. So the next stop is what's called scalar invariance, sometimes called strong invariance. So that means the same response scale. So that like or scaling, it's being used the same way in the group. So if a person from one group who has the same, uh, that same construct level, that's someone in the group, they should have the same score on the indicator. If not, that means they're using the response sets differently, or different interpretations of it. So we set the intercepts to be equal across groups. So we're just adding for, we're setting for the parameters to be equal, both loadings and our intercepts. We would run this, see, okay, do we have an increase in model fit now with adding that additional constraint? So we can start seeing, okay, looking at this, it looks pretty good. 
but I'd probably want to do a closer examination within it. So I can go ahead, get a model fit, and then I run a likelihood ratio test. Now it does give you this warning. Um, looking at this, they are not significantly different between metric and scalar, but again, our scale, that metric had an issue. So this is just out of practice. We can also then set the strict invariance, that's our variances for our errors and our covariance to be equal. And this means that the same factors in the same groups have the same degree of precision, essentially. So we're just adding another a parameter constraint to this. We can run that and see, okay, do we have good model fit and examine the information there? So this will be the process that you do for all four levels. And we can then compare, what we can actually do is we can compare all four models, the configural, the metric, the scalar, and the strict, and run essentially an ANOVA on this and see, okay, within this are the significant differences. And here we had between our configural and our metric, that was significantly different. That was an issue. So we actually have model non-measurement, or measurement non-invariance. This issues with our measure, it has different meanings across the groups. So now we need to do item detection mode within this. So what we would do is, actually before we do that, I'm gonna show you two other options, more of an automated approach. So rather than all of those steps with all that code, you could do this. This is, this function is gonna be going away in the next couple of years probably. So there's a new one I added to the end of it. But this actually just takes a measurement invariance that runs all the different models on our, on our model using our data and we just specify what group and it runs everything. And it reports our change in model fit indices and it runs our ANOVA test as well. In looking at this, it had that same thing, the loading is to configure that was significant. So it actually, it also detected measurement non-invariance. So here's the different model fit indices that we could use for the different options or the rules. I'm gonna recommend the mead one just because we have a large sample size, really large. So that's gonna be potentially an issue with likelihood ratio test. So I'm gonna see, do we have a reduction or a change in our CFI model fit greater than 0 0.002? If we have that across any levels, that means we have non-invariance. We can't say that we have that level of invariance. So within this, I'm gonna go back up to here and I'm seeing, okay, within our CFI and our Delta, anything that's greater than 0 0.002, because this is an absolute value for our Delta, that means it's an issue. So between going from configurable to our loadings or configurable to metric, there is a reduction in our CFI of 0 0.003. That's greater than our threshold. So that means, oh, that's our stopping point. We need to stop. So I would then go into, figure, okay, where are the items that are potentially problematic would be? So that's how I would go ahead and use that. Now to do that, here's some different informations within this. Uh, the first thing we'd wanna do is we would want to inspect the modification indices and see what's the largest and then free that one and un really unconstrain that parameter. And then if there's, we would compare that with the configurable and see, okay, is there, there's no significant difference. We know that item is the one that's causing issues. So what I do first is we're gonna go ahead and run modification indices and you do wanna do this one item at a time. And I'm just looking for anything that has a really large, this MI, that's modification index. So we have three and four, that's pretty high, maybe seven. And these are three and four on our group two as well. So that's like two and, or sorry, three and four, that could be an issue. I'd wanna then test one at a time. So I'd probably wanna start with three and then also include four. Uh, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna go ahead and do both three and four at the same time. In practice, you wouldn't do this, but just for time, I'm gonna show you how to do that. So I would need to take my code and I would add, I'd have to do this manually. So I'm saying, okay, C1, C2, this is saying that for group one and group two, get separate parameter estimates. So I'm bypassing that constraint for specific parameters. I'm saying, let them estimate freely across groups here. So I would run this and I'd be like, okay, within this, I'd use that same metric code, but I'm saving it as a new object. So it's running. Now she already ran, so it's really quick. I look at our overall, what our model fit looks like. This looks pretty good. Our Messier looks good. 
we can see here, rather than that point P3, point P4, it's C1 and D1. We have a 0.895. If I scroll down to our group two, it's not 0.895. We have a different estimate because when we let those be free, the estimated across our different groups, we're not constraining them. So we can see, okay, these items were different. I would want to compare the two and kind of see, okay, within this, do we have significant differences here? So looking at our, we have non-significant differences between our chi-squared test across these. So those two items, those are potential biased arms. I would say, okay, items three and four, I'd want to go back to my committee and be like, okay, these items, these are potentially problematic. Let's have a discussion about the wording of these or the context or how these could be interpreted and then determine if it's potentially true bias that we would need to then either revise the item or remove it. So there's a newer function here called equal test MI. It's a replacement of that previously automated one. It's the same idea within it, but it, it does a really nice job because it takes a little bit of time to run, but it gives you much more detailed information. So it has the, the test for like the ANOVA. It also gives you measurement fit like this and the different combined groups actually test more different combinations too within it. So it's a nice option. And you can also get all for all the different combinations, all of the actual CFA outputs within it. So it's, it's a nice feature, it's new. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna shift, we're gonna move away from classical tests, so away from mimic models and measurement and variance to now differential item functioning. Um, so we're actually using a package or a data set that's from the DIFR package, it's the vignette package, or vignette data, called verbal aggression. So this is a data set that comes from uh, Van Steele dot um, on uh, 2000, is made of the 316 subjects. So we have 243 women and 73 men. There's a questionnaire of 24 items about verbal aggression. Uh, items described a frustrating situation together with a verbal aggression response. And the correct answer would be coded as uh, the correct answer would be coded is um, as zero and one, the value of one meaning the subject would want to respond in that aggressive way. The zero would mean they did not. So because this is binary in nature, we're gonna use differential functioning from item response theory. It works better compared to like a CFA. So we're just gonna first load in the data and we're just gonna get just to the anger items. We're subsetting our data. So we start with, um, so just extracting those specific ones. Now we're gonna use the, um, the ETS, so the educational um, testing, oh, I always mess up the acronym, it's embarrassing. Um, ETS is classification. Uh, so there's three categorizations of differential item function that they use. We're gonna use the same idea because that's the, the common methodology within it, or the common practices. So if it has an A, for an item categorization, that means it's a negligible differential item functioning. It's there might be a small amount, but it's not it's not a big issue. C is that it's a large, there's a large magnitude of differential item functioning. It's a problem item. Everything that's between an A and a C, that's considered to be classified as a B. So at ETS, only C items are reviewed for bias by a diff committee of trained test developers and subject matter experts. So that's the standard practice with them, the psychometrics. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna first test for uniform diff and non-uniform diff separately. So we're gonna be using a logistic regression because that allows you to test for both. And you can actually test for both simultaneously, which is a nice option compared to some of the other methods within this. So we have our grouping variable, that's our variable 25. So if we scroll down, that's our gender variable, dummy coded, zero and one. And we're gonna say non-uniform diff. And we're gonna use the entire scale for the verbal items, all 24 items. So when we run this, what we do is it's running, looking at differential item function using a logistic regression method. And we've matched it on test scores. So that means Within the, the there are different samples, our two different groupings, we've equated them on the test scores. So we're saying, okay, individuals who have this high score, 
this high score, are there differences on each of the items? So it's the item level analysis rather than a total score one. But what we do is we set, the, we're matching on the total score. Because it's assumed that if it's not invari if it is invariant, that they everyone within the same ability would have the same scores. If not, then that's an issue. So here we have our p-value, and we say, okay, within this, do we see any item that's statistically significant? From here, we actually we're not seeing this. We're not seeing any um, non-uniform diff or differential item functioning, and that's different slopes amongst the groups. It's not that just different level of difficulty, so it's a little bit different. So here we have, it's all A's, it's all negligible effects, that's great. That's what we want. We can then also look at the uniform diff. That's just differences in difficulty depending on what group they're in, even though they should have the same ability within this. So we just change the type to U diff. That's our uniform. And here we actually, we do see uniform diff. So we are seeing the potential biased items of wanting to shout, wanting to curse, for these different items. So we're actually seeing differences based on group membership of these. So then I would want to say, okay, well, these are statistically significant, but what's the degree? What's the threshold? So if we see, these are all the items that were the, they're detecting diff. And anything that's a C or a large effect, so that's a larger shift, is something I want to bring back to the committee. Now look at these, these are all minor, minor diff. So it is detecting some diff, but it's not a large extent. So looking at this, I'm like, okay, so there is some diff, but it's not something I really, really need to be concerned about yet. Um, what I can then do is I can also test these all together. So let me go ahead and move this over here a little bit. So, we also are testing so many different items together. We have the potential fimoise error rate, just like multiple comparisons, yay. So what we'd wanna do potentially is we would wanna control for that. So we're gonna adjust our p-values to control for fimoise error rate to prevent type one errors. So I'm just gonna go ahead, I'm gonna add this command. So that's add, controlling for multiple comparisons. And I'm gonna go ahead and use, I'm saying what diff statistic. For this one, I'm gonna, rather than using Another option I'm using the likelihood ratio test. Same idea here, I have a group variable and I'm gonna say, okay, are there, is there diff here? Now we've already run this. We've just have our p-value, now we have our adjusted p-value here. And looking at this, I'm not seeing any differences for the adjusted. Because with so many comparisons, we're not able to detect it now. Again, we didn't see any large effects of differential item functioning, so it's not a surprise though. We can then also, I really like the visuals of IRT, which that's why I love this analysis so much, is within this, we can also see, okay, um, oops, what items have a high likelihood ratio test statistic? It's gonna show me a quick visual, like, okay, these four items, potentially 20, which is right on the line, I might wanna examine these items a little bit closer. So it's a quick visual I can see. We can also see, like, looking at this, okay, six, let me investigate six. So I'm gonna look at what's called the item curve and I'm gonna see what the item curve looks like for the two groups. So we have want to shout. And looking at probability, it's over, they're pretty much the two lines they overlapped. So I'm like, okay, yeah, there was some diff, but when we actually look at it, it's so small that I'm not able to really to see it there. We can also change our test to a different option. This is also another popular one called the WALT test. It's different than the LRT. And again, oh, here we have, this, again, this is not adjusted p-value, but we can see some differences here. So again, it's item six, like we saw earlier. And again, all of these are negligible. What I love though, is I like using the MERT package. So MERT is multidimensional IRT. It's a little bit, it's a different method. Of, it's the same idea. It's a different estimator and you can do multidimensional IRT. So you have multiple constructs within that that are related. So we go ahead and register multiple groups. It takes a little bit longer for it to run, it takes like maybe 20 seconds or so, but it's almost like running a factor analysis, but then it's from an IRT perspective. So we have our, for by group, so we have that information there. And now we can then look at the diff. So what we do is we go ahead and we run a diff perspective within this. And we're seeing, okay, what was the, 
what's our difficulty parameter in our discrimination parameter. This is a two PL model. So we're looking at, are there differences in the difficulty of each item, as well as what's the discrimination parameter for each item? Because we're allowing those to have different ones rather than like a rash model where everyone has the same discrimination parameter. Uh, so this allows us to then look at different slopes. If it was a rash model, we only have different locations. So this allows us then to look at for statistical differences across each of the groups. So we have our p-values for every single item within that. And it also gives us a plot. So we actually have our overlay. So our, our zero and our ones, we can actually see are they kind of, this, this is a really, really small diff, but we can kind of see that location. It's separated a little bit. It's a little bit offset. If you look here, those slopes, those are different. That's a little bit maybe that it's not able to detect a non-uniform diff, but that's, if it was a little bit more extreme, then that'd be maybe indicative of uniform diff. We can kind of see what that would look like. Um, but that's how we then go ahead and do the statistical testings within this. I really like IRT personally. I mean, there's issues with it too, just in terms of like your scaling versus bi or bin or binary variables, but it's it's possible you can also do graded response models like Likert scaling with an IRT. It's not as well developed though, so that's a potential issue that you might run into and have new specialized programs like R within this. But it's all possible. The um, the main thing is again large sample sizes and it's at the item level, which is really really nice because that's where you can start really fine tuning your instrument in removing or really flagging those potential biased items for removal with the committee and really making sure you have an equitable measure. Um, Cause if you're looking at this measure and you start comparing groups on it, or you're just trying to use an overall score, well, is the scores that you have, is it the actual, someone's actual score? Or is it a combination of their score plus differences based on what group they're in? And you, that's why it's equity in measurement so, so critical. Um, so I also want to mention, these are all within the R code. These are hyperlinked resources, all freely available. Um, it's also a couple of different citations for different criteria as well. Uh, but that way, if you want for more information, more resources, as well as more information about uh, diff detection, again, big fan of open coding, open data, and open resources. But that's how you'd go about using uh, some, some bias detection. Um, so that's all I have prepared, but why don't you open it up for, um, for questions or comments or thoughts. Uh, so just let me know. I'm going to go ahead and, um, uh, so yeah, feel free to unmute yourself or if you want to put stuff in the chat, that's great too. So let me go ahead and switch back over. Yeah, Jeff, Oh, and uh, before you go, please, if you can, um, there's the, the anonymous survey. Also, if there's things that are topics that you're interested in too, um, it'll be really helpful to get a sense of like, well, um, if something that you want me to do a deeper delve in, or maybe there's something else that you've been thinking about for quantitative methods, um, feel free to post that in there too, because that really helps when we're, th we're already thinking about programming for next year. So I, I would love to get your thoughts on that too. So please, 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 if you get a chance, please do the survey. Um, and again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to unmute or uh, put questions in the chat or feel free to also uh, follow up with me um, by email. If you have any questions or want to chat through things, happy to, to meet virtually as well or share resources or also just talk about your research. I, I, oops, I, yep, perfect. Um, so yeah, just let me know.